Welcome to another episode of Running Greenleaf. We get into the nitty gritty of operating real estate. We've got a couple topics as we're kicking off 2024. We just finished our end of quarter where we had some recaps on the different asset classes. Now we're going to touch base on just kind of what we're seeing going on in the market right now and where things are at from the operating side of the business. So we want to start with, I guess, what we're kind of calling second second chance retail. We don't really have a topic for it, but like it's interesting right now what we're seeing in a lot of the spaces. Right. Well, so. I mean, there's there's all sorts of second chance retail right now. We have the office market. The office market has pretty much been changed. Not not not. It's not like it's just something people it didn't fall out of favor. COVID happened, and COVID changed the yeah, entire. Yeah, it just changed what's going to be there. It changed the entire marketplace of how we use yeah. office space, and that you know we're all talking about it. We're all thinking about okay, what happens in in two years, five years, ten years to office, and then you know the conversations are what happens at, with the office and. You know what happens? Do we convert it to multifamily? There's a lot of conversations about people converting yeah. to multifamily. Those are con- those are hard ones, though. But yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. a big problem. I mean, I went through this whole conversation with somebody about just plates in an office building, and you can't just like drill a toilet uh, sewer pipe anywhere in an office building. If you drill that sewer pipe in the wrong place and you drill you through like rebarb, the whole floor is compromised. Yeah, you got a problem. Yeah, you got a problem. So we you know we're seeing stuff that's actually moving though in the. Uh, on the retail side, and most notably, uh, I mean, at least in Atlanta, what we've seen is a lot of bank transitions. Yeah. So when's the last right. time you were in a bank branch there, Dave? Well, I still go fairly often. For what? Depositing quarters with your kids or why? It still counts as going to the bank. You're going to the bank right. to get $2 bills, right? <laughs> I'm going to see what I can find there. But yeah, not too much. Not but too I much. mean, a lot of the, you know, in Atlanta, we had a lot of the, I would say, it, what it looks like is smaller or regional sized banks that were aggregated up and then you've got a bank on both sides of the street and they close one of those branches. So just around our office here, we've got five or six branches that are, have been empty for about a year or two. Yep. You know, the grass is growing up around them and, uh, but it's a good piece of real estate. It, single story. It's got drive throughs well, single parcel. So it's an easier problem to tackle. And a lot of those are getting converted to stuff now. Well, there's the big joke in Dunwoody that Dunwoody gets, when Dunwoody builds a new building, they build a bank for whatever reason in Dunwoody. And, and so for a while, there was actually a Wells Fargo and a Wachovia, and they were right next to each other. And so when Wells Fargo absorbed Wachovia, guess what happened? They kept two Wells Fargos open, literally two doors down from each other for, for years. Pro- I think it was, it was probably at least five years. So we had two Wells Fargos to go to. It's right the strangest there, yeah. thing. And, and, you know, maybe they had a lease... Well, you know, maybe there was, was a structure that would made sense. The, but. the concern was they didn't want someone else to move into the other Wells Fargo because it's basically a bank branch, and so another bank branch could have moved in there and taken some Good market point. share and, yep. and, and done what he. But eventually, they did finally shut down the second Wells Fargo location. But you know what's in the Wells Fargo second location now? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good use of a, of a drive through Well, uh, they used it's a COVID. It was a COVID testing center, but it has not found a second reuse. But then two doors down from the other Wells, Far, uh, the Wells Fargo, it was, there was a dry cleaner there, which was an old bank building. So the bank building turned into a dry cleaner and the dry cleaner shut down and then it turned it into a Chipotle drive through Yeah, and that's that's a drive through with no seating, right? It's just drive through Yeah, you drive up to the window. In fact, I probably need to go there once just to, to experience it, but literally a Chipotle, which I'm, yeah. I always thought that you just go into one. You don't go through I mean, a drive through but... I'm normally going in, but I think you look at the DoorDash and all the delivery services, it's easy. They can just go pick something up and on their way. Yeah, and you know what? We we might be the generation that missed we might, we might have missed that door delivery as part of our part of our upbringing. Like so think, yeah. Our kids think it's normal to yeah, to have everything delivered just, like that. Just, yeah. You just it's push different. buttons on your phone and get McDonald's delivered to you and <laughs> my kid of course <laughs> Is, uh, is great at ordering $10 worth of McDonald's and you pay $10 of delivery fee. So you pay $20 for getting McDonald's delivered to your house. Oh, gosh. And, yeah. And but, so, are, so are his friends. Yeah. But so that's, I mean, that's a second use of these bank branches. But Chipotle is a good tenant. You know, if you own that bank building, right? Because typically the banks are, it's a net lease that they're selling off that parcel. And now you have Chipotle as a tenant. That's a, it's a pretty decent swap. It's cre- yeah, it is a credit. It is a credit swap. Right. But like a COVID testing center might not be a credit yeah. swap. And the ones we've got around us, you know, the, even on my way to work, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing like four a day. I'm just my path to work that I see every day and knowing, okay, these things are in the, in the process of being renovated. One of them is a nail salon. And they kind of just park in the drive-thru. They don't necessarily use the, 
use the drive through And the three other ones are just gated off right now, and they're going through a lot of demo. So they're going to turn into something. They don't really have any, any signs up yet. I've been trying to figure out kind of what's there. But there's a seems to be a lot of movement around these baked branches of turning them yeah. into something else. Well, I, it's something interesting that's in the space. I, I think if you're looking at the overall how many real estate opportunities are out there to be tackled and figured out, it's like probably a suburban retail branch of a bank yeah. with a drive through and in a, in a single tenant situation and decent parking is going to be a lot easier to figure out than an urban tower. So right. starting at that front, it seems like there's a good amount of movement in trying to figure out what to do with these places, or at least people are spending money on it and, and looking for um, alternative uses. And, and so. you know, there's another product too, like strip malls too. When a strip mall gets to a certain age too, it loses its core tenant. That's also, it's a yeah, problem. You see other creative, that's when you put in like a, uh, CrossFit Center yeah, that CrossFit. goes into the middle of it, or right? Or Ollie's. Ollie's is a, is a new one, too. It's like a... Uh, They've been around, yeah. But they're taking big box space that they can go put discount uh, right. offerings in. In our, yeah. uh, one of the parking lots of our old restaurants, they took the old, um, I believe it was a Toys R Us. They took the Toys R Us footprint and they made it an Ollie's. And it's, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. So w- one thing we're seeing that's interesting, I, I mean, uh, it's going to be... I love watching real estate turn over and transfer and see what new ideas come in. And it's going to be interesting to see just kind of how these play out. We, we don't own any bank branches, but maybe it's something we take a look at, especially if you're looking for uh, opportunities to do something creative. But, okay, let's talk about uh, some of the other stuff. We think about the operating side of the business, and we are, we are obviously we're on the investment side. We're also the management side. We're doing uh, project management. We're doing a lot of CapEx works, lots of different maintenance projects. And one thing we're always trying to figure out is, is what we can do with our teams to create uh, high, not only high-performing teams, I think everyone wants to do that. It's kind of like an overused term, but enable people to be the, the best version of themselves. And we've gone through many different programs. We've looked at, you know, there's like the Myers-Briggs, there's DISC. We've looked at a lot of these things, and we've used them over time. Uh, not necessarily in the, hey, we are only going to hire this type of a person, but more in the standpoint of it's really helpful if I understand uh, how I operate and what my uh, ideal structure is. Andrew, if, if you understand yours, and then we can, we can have a little bit of give and take as we work together to make sure that we work together effectively. And then you take that out, and, and that can really resonate through your teams. A push we had a few years ago was we're really focused on our – I mean, everyone's looking at operating metrics. One of the ones we look at is our revenue per person. And we're trying to say, what can we do to improve our revenue per person? Uh, it helps make it more profitable as a business, but it also enables those people to have higher bonuses for people to earn more, people to get paid more, and uh, advance their career as we're able to, to grow and they're able to take on more work too. Well, I think there's, there's a foundation that, you know, even before all of this, I mean, you, Greenleaf believes in investing in people and when you invest in people, you invest in making them a better version of themselves and actually helping them get to bigger and better places in life. And so if you're doing that for them and you're making that investment in them, first of all, you're building a little bit, you're building a, an employee workforce that wants to stay here and wants to continue doing that because every year they become some, a better version of themselves. They're learning more about themselves. They're learning how they work with people. They're learning how they do things, what they like to do, what they don't like to do. And I think sometimes it's really important to realize you know, what do you, what do you not like to do or what are you not good at? And kind of do and some soul searching. Of, how do you find how not, not, hey, not how to do it? Maybe I shouldn't be doing that and I need to have a straight conversation with somebody, but hey, look, I'm not good at this, but I'm really good at this. And that's a hard conversation to have sometimes. But when you know that, you can use that person for what yeah. they're good at and what they want to do. When you're telling somebody to be an accountant and they want to be a salesperson, they can't. They can't do their job in an effective way. It would just take too much energy. It would take too much of their mental capacity to actually sort of shift the person they want to be yeah. versus who they're being. They could excel at a different spot. Right. Better. And, and so. this, uh, the, 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 the program we're doing right now called Culture Index, I mean, it talks about that. It talks about, like, I'm doing my job, and am I expelling? I have a certain number of, uh, we call it energy units, yep. and you have this many energy units to do your job. But are you expelling more energy units to do your job or less energy yeah. units to do your job? So is your job hard or is your job easy? And in theory, we want everybody's job, well, I mean, we don't want it to be easy, but we want it to be natural. natural. It's more like towards your natural state. So right. yeah, the, 
what we're using right now is culture index. And, and like I said, we've gone through other ones before, but I think you got to ask yourself, if you look at any of these programs in an organization, like they, they have to be genuine. If they're not genuine, everyone's going to see right through it. If you're just doing it to check a box, no one's going to do any of this garbage. And yeah. it, it's going to be irrelevant. You're not going to have any result from it. You could do any one of them, but if you don't do it genuinely, no one's going to care. No one's going to listen. Uh, I wouldn't listen either if someone was telling me something and they were just doing it to check a box. I'd right. not going to be interested. But that, the culture index part that we're using right now, it's been a good way where we're getting all of our teams together and taking the culture index. And it's really a, an assessment of preferred personality and communication methods for, for yourself. There's no like right or wrong version of it, but it can help identify like, look, if I want to receive, receive information for, via email and Andrew would rather talk about it, well, if I only look at email and Andrew only talks about it, then we're never going to actually communicate. We've got to, you know, I'm going to have to talk some and you're going to have to email some. So it, it, it's a little bit of that back and forth and understanding that. And it's super interesting when we've done it with teams of five, six, seven people who are working together on a daily basis and having them come together and see like, hey, how, what's the ideal way each of us works? And then how do we build a team structure and a dynamic that's effective for that group of people? That team is going to be completely different than another team. And that's totally fine. And it's, do they prefer to meet, have an in-person meeting at 10 o'clock or a video huddle at noon or a 7 a.m. You know, email exchange? Like which one is going to be most effective? And that's what we're really trying to build individually uh, for our teams, be kind of like very unique uh, entities within an organization. And some of the fun characteristics of the culture index that we, we talked about, we talked about like, you know, do you like to work by yourself or do you like to work in groups? Do you like to work in a social environment? Do you like to work in a heads down environment? And we had this funny example at, at our office where there's one, we have two people sharing an office. Are we allowed to say this? Yeah. I mean, we have two people sharing an office and the one person wants to work autonomously, be focused, and not be interrupted in what he's doing. And then the other person sitting in his office is a person who wants to be social talk through things. And so we have the two exact opposites sitting in the same exact <laughs> office. Right. It's like maybe <laughs> give the person that would like more quiet space their own space to operate in. Right. And then another and, social person who wants to work in a, in a group and likes, to, likes the interaction of doing things through communication and sociability, those people need to work together and they would actually do better together working in that environment versus if the person yeah. who wants to work by themselves and be autonomous and be heads down is working with someone social just it, at a certain point, it, 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 they're both expelling more energy. It's not natural for them anymore. So they have to be unnatural at work yeah. to compensate for what the other person yeah. needs. So all very interesting. Yeah, I think if you're looking at how do we, if you're someone who wants people to be back in the office, if you're someone who wants to, you know, make sure you got in-person stuff, you're probably going to have to figure out a way to cater specifically, like how is it going to work? What's the most effective way for people to be there and operate together? Uh, especially over the past couple of years, it's been very different in that working, uh, working environment. So we're using this as just a way that we can help build highly effective teams. And so far, it's kicking off pretty well. Um, another part we do with this is that we can go into our goal meetings and vision boards and kind of how that relates to everything. Yeah. Well, even more important, you know, uh, hiring. Like we're doing a big, yeah. big section on hiring right now where the, the, the tool actually lets us query five or however many people we want in the organization, and we say, okay, we, we're hiring this role. What are the characteristics of this role? We ask five or 10 people in the organization, what are the five characteristics of this role? That data is actually put together and then put together in a profile. And then when we're hiring somebody, we can make sure we, we might get two or three profiles of the right person for that, per, that role. And then when we actually have that person for the role, we give them this index or the survey, and we could see how well they fit in yeah. there. So it's back to like, we want to hire the right person for the right seat. So we're going to hire on the this, right team on the right team. Right. So yeah. if we're going to hire a, 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 a social person to sit down in, in, in an office and be a heads down accountant, that might not be the right person. But if we're, we're hiring somebody who's going to be having lunch with people or being social and uh, uh, trying to find uh, deals, that person's going to be a very social person. It has to be natural and easy for them to actually talk to people yeah. rather than sit heads down and do their work. Yeah. There, there's a lot of different ways to, to read into it and kind of assess how not only a, a person fits on a team, how do they effectively work together in a group? How is that team structured? When, when and where do they operate? Uh, and I think we're, use, we're kind of using Culture Index as a little cheat sheet to just better understand each other and hopefully build even more 
uh, effective operating teams. So that's something we're working on uh, right now. Another part of the year, you know, shift out of culture index a little bit. Something we've always done is our goal meetings. So green for operating a business, we're operating property management, maintenance. One of the things we're always looking at is what are our annual goals. So we create these cool little vision sheets. We think they're pretty cool, but it's basically showing like what is your individual focus for the year. So our organization exists, it, it, you know, it's a teamwork between an organization and people where the people have their goal and their vision of what they want to accomplish for the year and the organization helps them achieve that and those individuals help achieve the goals of the organization. So teamwork and getting all that stuff done, but we have each person on our team create a, a vision sheet and one of our managers, like they're, they're saving magazines for months. Think of any magazine you can really get your hands on. It doesn't much matter. Uh, and think back to, I don't know, fifth grade where you're flipping through those things and making a scrapbook and you're carving out like, vision, what is it? I think she calls it a vision yeah, board. Yeah, it's a vision board. Vision yeah. board, yeah. And, that, and that's basically, what's your focus for the year and what's your vision look like? We go through those and do those with the whole organization. So everyone has one. Uh, and then it's even, you make copies of it and people have them in their office. It's another way that people can get a better idea of, you know, what are you looking for for the year? So what kind of fun goals do you have for the year, Dave? I divide mine up where I'm, I'm half personal goals, half kind of work goals. There's a little bit, you try to have a little bit of balance there, right? And, and normally work focuses around what kind of growth can we achieve in a period. You know, my personality is very data-driven, so I want to see some of our metrics continually improving uh, that we can work on. Uh, we've got core metrics we use all the time. Like we're looking at, always looking at retention. We're looking at our operating costs on a per square foot or a per unit basis. So I'm always saying, okay, okay that's kind of like the outcome, but what are we going to do in the middle there to really move those numbers? So, uh, so those are your business. So those, that's, those are, that's kind of the goals. business focuses on that. How front. about on the personal side? The, what do you, what do you have for 2024? You know, I, I got three kids. So focused on what time can I spend with those kids? And one of my favorite ones is just doing all the high points in each state. And one, so one, I'm on 20, my daughter who's 10 is on 25. High points so far. Right, and you do one trip with one kid to give them some special time together. With yeah, one kid, one trip. One kid, it's a little bit. Trip. You know, yeah. my my littlest kid loves uh, dirt track car racing, so that's pretty fun. In the south, going to a dirt track car race is an incredible experience. Yeah. It's super fun. Well, when he's big enough, you could take him to that um, the uh, heavy equipment. The heavy equipment uh, play, play, play yard. Plays. What is that thing called? I'm pretty sure if you want to, they just let you drive the cars with these things. If, you, if you're going to bring one, I think you could get in it and figure <laughs> it out. But he's only six, so he might not be driving quite yet. But yeah, no, there's some young yeah. kids that are out there on, those, on the dirt tracks, like getting started and learning, and it's really cool to see. Yeah, so my, you know, my personal goals are really around family and, and what is it that I can do on an annual basis. So how about you? What do you think? Oh, I, I mean, we've got to have some running goals. There's always yeah, Andrew there's and always I, running we're running the run, London Marathon. Do you have a time we're, goal? Uh, I have, I ran the Berlin marathon in a four, four thirty, And so I just want to beat four thirty, and then I'll be happy. But I think right. I'm going to be between a four, four hour and four thirty marathon. How about you? I got my goal. will be one minute faster. One minute than faster yours. than me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And you're not, you're going to train like hundreds of hours less than me and you're going to beat me at the finish line. Right. That's how it's going to work. I'm definitely going to have less training. Yeah, you know you can't win on this one because, like, I'm 15 years older than you. So if you win, you beat a, someone who's 15 yeah. years older than you. And if you lose, you lost to someone My kids will be disappointed than... if I don't win. Okay. They'll be like, well, how did you not win? <laughs> it's a valid question. <laughs> it's like I got some reasons. It's not physically possible. And, and personally, I'll say, you know, this is the last year of my kid in the house. And then you can run more. And then I could run more. But we got, you know, we got a we got a. Then senior you can do the five-day... Then Alaskan we can, adventure race. Then my wife and I can go out to dinner every night of the week. You can, you can stay home. Your kid, kid can watch himself right now. Yeah, he, do, he does. You're right. But sometimes we have dinner I responsibility, and we're sort of used to, like, making the kid dinner, and so we're almost... Yeah. So is, is that a goal for 2024? The goal for 2024 is to get the kid into college he wants to go to. Oh, there you go. And, of course, run a couple of marathons along the way. And uh, my wife and I are planning... Uh, she's going to hopefully retire over the next few years, depending on the college my kid goes to, so... That doesn't sound like a very smart and specific goal right there. You're right. You're right. Retire they're, they're, over the next couple of years at some point, maybe. <laughs> we got to tighten that one up, I guess. We yeah. Tighten that one up. Yeah. You go give her a hard time on that. Who's yeah. Thinks? Well, she, you know, she's got a job, you know. Yeah. So goals are always something we, you know, we, every quarter we sit down as our teams. So, right. So we're talking about adding people into a team. That team is sitting down on a quarterly basis and going through what their goals are. Uh, 
they're trying to see what can they do f- with each other to help that person uh, achieve what their next goal may be. It, it may be work-related. It may be personal-related. Um, it may be, hey, I need to go take a couple of days off to go do this, and how are we going to cover for that person as a team? But pretty open environment, and, and that's really what I think has driven a lot of our success as our teams get better and better and better on the operating side yeah. and continue to improve. And I'll even add this dimension to it. Like, I think Greenleaf exists, and you know, I've been here for five years, five years plus. And, and the reason I stay here is because, to me, this is a platform for service, and we have a platform of service to our employees, service to our investors, and service to our customers. And, yeah. you know, with that service, you know, we're creating value for others. And, and if we do it right, it benefits us too, but you know we have to get those other three dimensions right. So when we're authentically serving others, I think that creates a platform for people to want to be here, want to be a part of it, and it also helps us be successful. But our success is almost a byproduct of the values of what we're trying to create here in our service to others. Yeah, if we do a good job in that service and we provide a good quality yeah, uh, experience, a, a good, a good experience for our employees, a good investment for our investors, and a good product to our customers. Yeah. Yeah, that's the I mean, goal. That's it. Yeah, I mean, kind of leading into that, we've got an internship that we're doing this summer. We, we've had an internship program for a few years, and we've expanded it a little bit uh, this summer. And it's kind of a unique experience where an individual is coming in. The first thing that they're doing with Greenleaf is they're doing a volunteer event that we do with an organization called uh, Rise for Hunger, which, which is here in Cobb County. And they are basically packaging up, I don't know if it's thousands or millions, tens of thousands, millions of meals per year as a company we pack up thousands yeah we do thousands but i mean they're doing that as a warehouse globally uh delivering meals uh throughout the world it's really impressive organization so that's going to be kind of the kickoff to our internship this year is volunteering at that with us as an organization Uh, pretty much our entire organization takes that afternoon we go do that together and they're going to rotate through the different uh divisions of our organization. So again, we're vertically integrated. So we have everything from our CapEx team that's on the ground doing maintenance on a weekly basis to project management, our finance, accounting, acquisition side. Uh, you know, we're doing it, doing that collectively as a whole. And then they're gonna wrap up the summer with one of the, one of the big things uh, that we do here at Greenleaf that Josh, one of our other partners, really leads up is our summer camp. And we do this in Gainesville, Georgia. we we'll offer a multi-day summer camp uh, for all of our residents that are in that market and it's free for them. Uh, we're volunteering as an organization and really getting everything behind that to show up and provide kids with really just a positive end of summer experience. Uh, it enables their parents to have essentially free childcare yeah. for that whole week as they're coming in. And we're doing everything from science projects to sports, everything. Water pro- oh, and don't forget the most important thing. If you're watching this video right now, you are invited to be a camp counselor for one to three days in Gainesville, Georgia. So come sign up, and you can be a camp counselor with yeah. Dave and I for three it's a days. Cool, it's a cool experience. Yeah, we essentially you know, shut – the, the, well, I'm not going to say the company shut down. Every, <laughs> shutting it down. Yeah, but yeah, It's the, not the, shutting it down. For but those three days, every single, almost every single Greenleaf employee is at that camp. Yeah, well, they're, they're, doing their, they're doing their day job, and they're doing their camp job. They're still – everything's yeah. still running and working. So yeah. um, it's, a great, it's a great three days. Yeah, so that's that's a lot of fun uh, to kind of wrap up the summer. We finished that at the end of July uh, here in Georgia. Kids are going back to school pretty close to after that, so uh, it's a great experience. And that's uh, that's our summer internship that we're putting together this year. So we'll have a few uh, few students that are in that and kind of rotating through, and hopefully get to have a great, uh, unique summer experience at an investment management volunteer platform. So, all right, that's uh, that's kind of all we we've got for. A recent update right here. So we're excited about uh, kind of where things are going. We're really eager to, you know, keep sharing how this culture index journey goes. And yeah, we're done. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. Let's go. Get back to work. Thanks for watching, everyone. For more tips on operating and investing in real estate, please check us out at greenleafmanagement.com or find us on YouTube and Spotify.